Today's webinar is a special joint presentation by four organizations, Mothers Out Front, Rocky Mountain Institute, Sierra Club, and PSR. We're presenting highlights from our new report, Health Effects of Gas Stove Pollution. You know, many of us cook, food on, cook our food on gas stoves, and the gas industry has always told us that burning gas is clean. So it's kind of a rude shock to find out that, in fact, gas stoves create significant levels of indoor air pollution and can cause serious problems for our health. You know, this is a bad time to be getting this news. A lot of us, probably most of us, are facing tensions and anxiety due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And some people are actually struggling and suffering. So especially at this time when more of us are in our homes and cooking more, none of us want to hear that our stoves could be causing harm. But as we've learned from COVID-19, we just can't ignore the warnings from scientists and public health officials. It's important that we know about threats to health from our stoves. And it's important that we do what we can to protect ourselves in the moment and then over a longer time frame, address the underlying problem of gas use. After all, all of us deserve to live in clean, safe, and healthy homes and communities. So you'll learn more about these issues uh, in just a few minutes on the webinar. And I also hope that all of you will read our full report, which was just released yesterday. You can download the report from each of our organization's websites. Now we're going to hear from five presenters today, so I'd like to move quickly into their presentations. First, just a very few housekeeping details. Uh, the audience will be kept muted during the presentation. And if you have questions, and we hope you do, please type them into the little chat box as we go. The chat box is in the dock in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, after the presenters have all finished, I'll read those questions off one at a time and uh, um, open the floor to our presenters to answer. And if we do work our way through all the questions in the chat box, then I'll invite you to raise your hands to pose a question using the little hand icon in the dock. You'll then be called on and unmuted by Julia Morgan, PSR's web manager, and you'll be able to ask your question out loud. So thank you, Julia, for that and for all of your tech support. And then finally, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, next slide, please. my pleasure to introduce our um, speakers today. I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they'll be speaking. Uh, our first presenter will be Brady Seals. Brady is a senior associate on Rocky Mountain Institute's building electrification team, where she works at the junction of buildings, air quality, and public health. Prior to this role, Brady spent 11 years working to accelerate the transition from cooking with solid fuels to clean cook stoves in over 16 countries. And Brady is also one of the two lead authors of today's report, Health Effects from Gas Stove Pollution. So congratulations, Brady, on this great report. Our second presenter today will be Dr. Lynn Ringenberg. Dr. Ringenberg is a retired pediatrician and emeritus professor of pediatrics at the University of South Florida and a former, former Army, Army colonel. Uh, Dr. Ringenberg, who co-founded PSR Florida, is passionate about medical education and health care for underserved populations. After Dr. Ringenberg, our next speaker will be Andy Krasner. Andy Krasner, MPH, is the Program Manager of Climate and Health for Greater Boston Physicians for Social Responsibility and a volunteer with Mothers Out Front. Her work focuses on the intersection of the built environment, climate change, and public health. And Andy is the other lead author of today's report. So congratulations to you too, Andy, on the report. After Andy, we'll hear from Mark Kresowitz. Mark Kresowick is a Deputy Regional Director for the Sierra Club. He is a very amateur chef as well. Now, I want you to know those are his words, not my words. Living and cooking in the District of Columbia with his wife and two young children, whose health and health in the kitchen are the reasons he now has a faster, more precise, safer, and healthier induction stove. Before his family upgraded, he used to invite himself over to cook with his friend's induction stove because it was more fun. Our final speaker today will be Bruce Nillis. Bruce is a, man a managing director at Rocky Mountain Institute where he oversees its building electrification program. He previously worked at Sierra Club where he built and led its Beyond Coal campaign and the US Department of Justice Environmental, Environment and Natural Resources Division. So let's move on to the next slide and our first speaker, Brady Seals. Thanks, Barb. 
Before I start, I'd just like to say what a pleasure it's been working with these three great organizations on the report. Um, my first call was actually to one of the PSR member chapters in Philadelphia. And the person I talked to actually knew my grandfather, who is a doctor in the Philadelphia area, who's now 90 years old. And yesterday I had the great pleasure of sharing this report with him, uh, which made me very proud. So just a quick overview why we decided to do this and who we are. This came up, we, we realized that there was a gap in information that was accessible about the health impacts from gas stoves. By the numbers, we know that there's been 40 years of research and we decided in this latest study to focus on the last 20 years to do the in-depth review of peer-reviewed studies. We compiled thousands of pages, thousands of studies into eight key findings. And then we wanted to spotlight some bright spots. We looked at Massachusetts, California, California, Canada, and the importance of focusing on environmental justice for this issue. The product is about 10 pages of text with some photos and graphs and over 100 citations, which I think is just shows, we hope this is fact forward, um, direct and non-technical, accessible to everyone, including uh, for many of us wanting to be able to send this to our mothers. And we had eight expert reviewers from Harvard, Yale, University of Colorado, and these folks very kindly lent us their expertise in reviewing this report. Next slide, please. A little bit of background. These are really three key facts that we wanted to pull out from the report and, and front and center. And the first is just that we spend 90% of our times indoors. Even before these trying times, we spend a lot of our, our time in buildings. And the EPA states that indoors, the pollutant levels may be two to five as much as 100 times higher than outdoor pollution levels. A major source of this pollution is the gas stove. In terms of nitrogen dioxide, homes with gas stoves have 50 to 400% higher NO2 emissions than homes with electric stoves. So we felt like there wasn't quite a one-stop shop to find the information that you may need to know on the health impacts and the scientific findings about stoves. And we hope that this report um, provides that. Next slide. So the, the report is essentially a summary of eight key findings, which we've organized from indoor air being uh, unregulated to the different kinds of pollutants that we've differentiated in the report um, to these these sort of shocking visuals on the pollutant levels we can find from cooking inside could be much higher than outdoor standards. Uh, the well-documented health risks, the risk particularly to children, um, the importance of focusing on lower income households who could be disproportionately affected, and then the, the solutions. Ventilation is crucially important, but it's not a sole uh, strategy. And finally, that electric cooking is a cleaner option. We highlighted four case studies of action, as I mentioned before, and then we provided practical recommendations for policymakers, individuals, healthcare professionals, researchers, and funders. So you'll hear a little bit more about this, but in summary, I would just like to say that no matter if it's in the developing world or here in the US, indoor air is so often invisible. And I think that in part, this report hopes to bring to light some of these issues and finally, address urgently the need to have clean air in, inside the home. Um, so we hope that you found this report useful. Thank you. Thank you, Brady. Uh, let's move to our next slide and to our next speaker who will be Dr. Lynn Ringenberg. Dr. Ringenberg. Thanks, Barb. Uh, thanks, Barb, and, and special thanks to the lead authors, uh, Brady and, and Andy, and all of those that were involved uh, with the study, uh, those on the call today. It's really been an eye-opener for me, um, you know, decades of scientific research showing that uh, gas stoves burning fossil fuels release toxic pollutants that can damage human health, and I've spent over 25 years in academic medicine and uh, years in private practice prior to that. And I can tell you that this topic is not part of medical school curricula in general or taught in most residency training programs. Um, there is little 
to no public education, at least that I'm aware of, and uh, our community leaders, unfortunately, they really think about health issues when they're making important decisions. So I really, th this is a very important report, uh, and I'm pleased to be involved with it today. And obviously, uh, it's our vulnerable populations that we really need to think about, and um, they're listed on the slide, but infants and children and those with pre-existing medical issues are especially vulnerable. And issues like asthma, heart disease, sickle cell anemia. Um, you know, kids are not miniature adults. Kids have their own unique growth and development, um, their own set of needs. And in, in this instance for gas stove pollution, you know, they, they breathe faster than adults do. Infants even breathe faster than children do. They have smaller, more sensitive airways that are easier to get plugged up. Um, they are uh, less able to detoxify and eliminate pollutants compared to adults because those functions are still developing in their bodies or livers, etc. They have a higher lung surface to body weight ratio. And they have immature lungs and a nervous system and immune system that's all kind of revving up and developing. So uh, they are at risk for any kind of pollutant. Um, and then they have, they're smaller or shorter, they're closer to the ground, and that's where a lot of pollutants tend to settle. Um, so that's why we need to really keep this um, population of patients, if you will, on the front burner, although I know we need to be on the back burner, but for this talk. Um, so next slide, please. And I'll try and go through this uh, pretty fast here. Um, I think the, the report outlines all of this very, very nicely, but if you look at the two toxics that we're most concerned about, and that's nitrogen uh, dioxide and carbon monoxide, we're gonna talk about NO2 on this slide. And kids in homes where they're cooking with gas have a anywhere from 24 to 42% higher chance of having asthma symptoms, either currently or lifelong. Um, the the uh, picture here on the, I don't have a pointer, so the picture on the left right be, be, below the child that's um, using the inhaler, that, that's a, an abnormal lung. That's an inflamed um, bronchial, an airway. Um, it's inflamed, it's scarred, it's red, it's swollen compared to the little one below it, which is a, a normal picture of an airway. Um, so when, when kids get these issues with, with wheezing, um, asthma symptoms, asthma exacerbation, coughing, it means more ER visits, more hospital admissions, more missed school, work for parents. Um, so there are a lot of things to think about. Um, there's also been a lot of literature uh, more recently really about the link between early exposure to indoor air pollutants from, again, from gas appliances and impaired cognitive functioning in the preschool years, which can ultimately lead perhaps to a higher risk of ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or other types of learning disabilities. So we need to really pay a lot of attention to this. Um, there's science that shows we have um, increased cardiovascular effects with the pollutants from gas stoves, increased cardiovascular disease, premature death, uh, more arrhythmias, more heart attacks, et cetera. So again, something that we need to pay attention to. And you need to think, you know, with children, especially in these, in the unborn child and the infant and young child, their brains, their nervous systems are still developing. And they are trying to make millions upon millions and billions of synapses and connections in their central nervous systems to make sure everything develops as it should. And so the last thing they need either in utero or out uh, as an infant or young child is a pollutant that might interfere with those synapses and connections. That's the concern about this early exposure with uh, impaired cognitive function. Um, next slide. And when we talk about carbon monoxide, um, something that we don't see a lot of here um, in Florida at least, except during hurricane season primarily, but um, it, Carbon monoxide is really, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible uh, 
gas. It's colorless, it's odorless, it's tasteless, um, it's insidious. It sneaks up on you and can kill you. So I think, again, I'm, I'm glad to see this really having a priority in this report. Um, low levels probably don't affect most people, but when they say most people, I think they mean adults. Most of the EPA studies that I'm aware of use adults as a standard, typically a 60 kilogram male. Um, so an infant breathing at 60 or 70 times a minute may have more effect than someone breathing 12 to 15 times a minute. And certainly people with pre-existing heart problems experience more issues like increasing chest pain and fatigue. So uh, something to be aware of. And as the CO2 levels go up, uh, you may develop symptoms like flu-like symptoms, um, and you, typically without fever or headache, fatigue, dizziness, nausea, vomiting. Um, and again, just th as the levels increase, the symptoms worsen and worsen, where you start having tachycardia, racing heart, uh, increased memory, disorientation, loss of balance, and leading to unconsciousness, and with high levels, seizures, coma, and, um, and ultimately death. So it's a serious, serious pollutant that needs to be taken very seriously. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it's, it's our responsibility from, from a health perspective, at least, that we need to, to do everything we can to protect people, but especially children and our vulnerable populations. Um, you know, kids are 33% of the current population, but they're 100% of the future and need to be physically and mentally healthy. And so I think this report is really going to help make that happen. And again, thanks for inviting me to uh, join you guys today. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Well, thank you, Dr. Ringenberg. Uh, our next speaker will be Andy Krasner. So we have the next slide, and uh, Andy Krasner is up. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this call. My name is Andy Krasner, and I'm a volunteer with Mothers Out Front. Mothers Out Front is a volunteer organization made up of mothers and others, and we are working for a livable climate for our children. I have two school-age children, and I actually started to get curious about indoor air pollution because I was worried about their health. Several years ago, my mom came to visit me from Oregon, and during her visit, she kept complaining about the smell of gas when I was cooking, and I actually couldn't smell what she was smelling, so I was curious about it, and I started to wonder if it could be harming my kids. And when I started to dig into the research, I was actually floored to find out how much evidence there is that cooking with gas puts children at a higher risk for uh, developing asthma. And I had just never heard of that. And most people I talked to hadn't heard of the risk either. Fast forward to the present, uh, with the stay at home advisories in place and with schools closed, uh, we're all cooking more at home and most people are in the dark about the risks that come, in, that come with cooking with gas. So um, with more cooking comes more indoor air pollution. And so I wanted to share some simple actions you can take um, right now to reduce the air pollution when you're cooking. Um, it looks like some of my slide is um, missing some of the red marks. So uh, I'm gonna start at the bottom left-hand side and move clockwise, and hopefully you'll be able to uh, see them. Um, this is a picture of a kitchen and your personal kitchen may or may not have some of these features. What you're gonna wanna do is start in the um, lower left and we have um, actually a carbon monoxide detector that's right below that hood. And it won't actually reduce pollution, but it will let you know if uh, carbon monoxide levels are being if you're cooking, you can turn on the over the stove range hood. Um, using an externally vented range hood when you cook has been shown to be effective in reducing air pollution from burned gas and reducing respiratory symptoms in children. But here's the thing, many range hoods are actually not vented to the outdoors. My, my range hood looks almost exactly like the one that's in this picture. And when I checked, uh, it wasn't vented to the outdoors. So if it's not vented to the outdoors, um, it's just recirculating the air in your kitchen and it's not very useful at removing the air pollution. Just as an, as an aside, 
all your other gas appliances, your HVAC system, your water heater and dryer are all required to be externally vented to the outdoors for health reasons. But we don't have that regulation for your gas stove or for the, for the over the stove range hood. So if you don't have a vented range hood, you can turn on other ventilation. Uh, as you can see in this particular picture, to the left of the window, this kitchen has a fan and you could turn that on. If you don't have mechanical ventilation, opening a window will help reduce indoor air pollution too for, you know, if you open it for three to five minutes. I live in Boston and we don't typically open our windows in the winter, so many people may not be able to open a window because of weather, safety, or because the windows don't physically open. If you can't ventilate, you can reduce air pollution by minimizing the use of your stove um, by using electric appliances. Next slide. So, we don't expect that everybody has uh, all of these appliances, but these are some ideas for what you can use instead of using your gas stove. Um, you can boil water um, in, um, you can use a crock pot or a pressure cooker, uh, a toaster oven or a microwave. And some people have invested um, in single induction burners. Uh, if, you're, if you're not a very skilled cook, like I must admit, I'm not, a single induction uh, or a single burner works just fine for me. Uh, while we are advocating for people to use ventilation if they have it, we know that most people don't use it because of a number of reasons. They forget uh, it, it, or it's too noisy or they didn't know that it was effective. Um, but the most effective way to reduce pollution from a gas stove is to switch out the source of the pollution. So as homes become more and more energy efficient, reducing air pollution is even more important because there's less natural exchange of air. So next slide. So the next time you're shopping for a new stove, um, consider an electric stove or an induction stove top, which will eliminate the pollutants produced from burning gas. Induction stoves are as precise and fast as gas stoves and more efficient. When my nine-year-old gas stove uh, had two burners that wouldn't work, we decided to replace it with an induction stove. And I have to say the cooking experience is a lot better. Before I wrap up, I just want to recognize that the burden of environmental pollutants is disproportionately borne by low-income communities and communities of color. Environmental justice communities are more likely to be exposed to both outdoor and indoor air pollution, uh, which has additive effects. And they are more likely to suffer from the effects of air pollution, including asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. So the responsibility to address existing health disparities from air pollution cannot be left solely to individual actions alone, although we have recommended them. People have varying circumstances, capacity, and resources to adopt these recommendations. We also need policy changes to ensure more equitable and better health outcomes for everyone. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark. Thank you very much, Andy. If you wanna advance to the next slide, please. Uh, like Andy, uh, I have two uh, young preschool age children in my case uh, and can very much vouch um, for the better cooking experience and uh, most importantly not just healthier but safer experience with an induction stove um, as the stove top itself does not heat up um, only residual heat so uh, it is much safer more fun it boils faster and more precise uh, than uh, a gas stove. In addition, uh, electric stoves and really uh, electric buildings writ large are better for the climate, reducing climate pollution, have the opportunity to create good paying jobs, um, are cheaper, more affordable to operate, um, and generally are better all around. So highly recommend moving forward with an electric stove. And I'm gonna talk a little bit um, just about how policy ways we can make that happen as you move to the next slide. But the biggest barrier uh, to improving indoor air quality, getting these gas stoves um, and other gas appliances um, cleaned up and ultimately out of homes uh, is the gas companies themselves. Um, gas 
uh, revenues from uh, buildings, from homes in particular, uh, are the vast majority of the revenues that uh, gas companies that deliver to end users receive. This is their bread and butter. Um, and they know that uh, gas stoves uh, are the key uh, to um, moving beyond gas and electrifying buildings. That's because most homeowners don't think about their heating, about their um, clothes drying, their hot water heating, uh, don't really care. As long as the water is, is hot, uh, as long as it comes out when you need it, as long as your clothes get clean, the um, as long as your home you is The entered is invalid. You enter you don't, three, you don't, zero, zero, four, eight, right. two, two. Please re-enter your access code followed you, by the pound per half. You don't need, um, uh, you're not thinking about uh, your gas appliances. Um, you don't care if they're electric or gas. But in gas stove, people control. have an emotional attachment uh, to their gas cooking. Um, and so... The gas industry knows this and has launched uh, PR campaigns uh, to emphasize and highlight uh, the supposed benefits of uh, gas cooking. What they're not telling you uh, is these very health effects that we that Dr. Ringenberg and Andy have highlighted so uh, um, forcefully. We move on to the next slide. So what can we do about this? How can we overcome the power of uh, the gas industry in some cases where the gas industry is even charging their own customers um, to run these campaigns uh, and um, uh, obscure the facts uh, when it comes to uh, cooking with gas and cooking with electricity? The first way is to do exactly what we're doing today is to educate stakeholders, to share this information, um, to uh, push back on the false promise and false solutions uh, that the gas industry highlights, um, to highlight the safety and climate threats of gas um, cooking. To establish partnerships, to engage with and listen to our labor partners, our, the workforce uh, who's been engaged uh, in, um, in this space for a long period of time, understand their concerns and the opportunities uh, that are present. But most importantly, as Dr. Ringenberg and Andy both highlighted, uh, to start with uh, those on the front lines of this issue in on low and fixed income families, affordable housing, places who are bearing the biggest brunt and a burden uh, of both uh, gas pollution, indoor air pollution, uh, as well as energy and housing affordability. Um, talk to them, understand uh, what their concerns, issues are, um, and start with solutions uh, to electrify those communities, uh, to electrify uh, homes um, that are uh, uh, already struggling to pay their bills and to stay in quality housing, to improve the housing, to create programs that can do health and safety repairs, improve efficiency, and electrify uh, homes first and foremost. Uh, to engage in rate design, uh, engage with your public utility commissions, engage with utilities to establish rate designs that make electric stoves and uh, electric appliances more affordable, um, including percentage of income uh, payment uh, programs that limit and cap uh, the energy burden of um, uh, low and fixed income families. To establish incentives to bring down the cost uh, of these alternatives, including rebates and other incentives for electric stoves and other uh, electric and, uh, appliances to start by building out our local advocacy efforts, to talk to your neighbors as you're educating, but also work together. Uh, more than 30 communities in California and Brookline, Massachusetts have worked together to actually ban new gas hookups uh, in their communities to say enough is enough, we're moving beyond gas, uh, it's time to stop uh, making the problem worse. And finally, to engage at the state level, to set climate pollution goals for the building sector, to uh, ratchet up and improve our building codes to ensure that everyone has access to uh, accessible, safer, healthier, uh, and frankly, more fun gas stoves and gas appliances. Bruce? Thank, uh, thank, thank you, Mark. You, uh, oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and apologies to all my uh, phone shows. A very inconvenient time to cut off. Um, Thank you, Mark, and also thank you, Andy, whom I did not get a chance to thank earlier. And our final speaker will be Bruce Millis. Bruce? Thank you, Barb. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to join um, this panel today on a, a very important subject. And, and I, like I think most everyone else, uh, was literally unaware of this issue uh, 18 months ago. I spent most of the last two decades working on air 
pollution issues related to coal-fired power plants. And it was literally 18 months ago when I read the work from Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and others that really was raising a red flag that uh, something was really amiss in particularly um, the work where they dug into looking at what happens in, here in California in the winter time when we close our windows, everyone turns on their gas stove. The level of air pollution that they were finding were ones I had not seen anywhere across the country related to coal-fired power plants. Uh, so the two pollutants that um, uh, Dr. Ringenberg uh, highlighted, the one that really caught my attention was the nitrogen dioxide. It's one of six pollutants that EPA has regulated for almost 50, uh, for 50 years as a part of the Federal Clean Air Act. It's been studied, it's been well researched, and outdoors is actually a remarkable success story. That is, there's not a single county in the country where today they exceed EPA's outdoor air quality standard. And to find, says Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, that uh, as many as 12 million Californians, and by extrapolation, tens of millions across the country, were breathing levels that you can't find outdoors in the United States was just a real eye-opener uh, and part of the impetus for uh, today's report. So in terms of policymakers, what we have been, what we have put together in the report, and this is just a highlight of a few of them, is that right now the approach to protecting, ensuring indoor air quality is protected and safe, uh, both in new and existing buildings, uh, is completely fragmented. There's not a single body in the country that says, these are safe levels of air pollution and we should be building buildings and renovating buildings to these standards. Similarly, at the state level, it is largely, um, there are a few guidelines uh, and even those that are currently being used, and let me give you the example here in California, uh, the state is in the middle of updating its 2022 building codes. And right now they are relying on 10 year old EPA standard for the outdoors to determine what will be safe and healthy for a building built in 2023 that will be around for 100 years. It doesn't reflect the best science. And so that really is the, one of the top recommendations we have for policymakers at the state and federal level, which is there is a lot of recent science, um, as Brady Seals mentioned, uh, the Canadians and the WHO have been doing terrific work really understanding the impact of um, nitrogen dioxide on the most sensitive populations. We need to be setting guidelines that then inform all the decisions we're making around new construction and renovation of existing buildings. So that is first and foremost, and it's an issue in every state. Secondly, once we are clear on what is a safe and healthy level for indoor air quality, making sure that all of our building codes, which oftentimes are set at the local level, uh, as well as the state level, are indeed being built so that we are not creating buildings today that we know objectively are gonna create problems for the tenants decades to come. The third, and this is really putting the onus on the manufacturers. Um, there have been studies and report, as Brady said, for over 40 years. Uh, back 34 years ago, the Consumer Product Safety Commission who is charged with protecting uh, consumers from uh, dangerous products asked US EPA, are gas stoves and levels of nitrogen dioxide a problem? And EPA wrote back saying, absolutely, there is some considerable scientific basis to be uh, looking and, and trying to understand this problem and protecting consumers. There are no warnings today on gas stoves uh, that you should vent, regardless of whether um, you're boiling water, baking bread, anytime you turn on that gas stove, it is critical that there be some way to get that pollution out of the home uh, and not concentrate in your kitchen and throughout the building. The other items on this list, uh, and this really touches on the fact, uh, particularly time when there are 30 million Americans who are really struggling out of work uh, and the whole other myriad of problems associated with uh, the pandemic is helping people make this transition, building back better. Whatever we do going forward to help people uh, get out of this economic and public health crisis? How do we help those who most uh, need it financially to make sure our federal and state resources are helping with financial incentives and other uh, grant programs to help the transition from gas uh, to low or zero pollution alternatives? Public buildings, uh, we spend a lot of money on um, 
publicly assisted programs, uh, we should be making sure that those are all aligned with our public health goals. We should not be installing appliances we know objectively are creating health risks. And then lastly, uh, when you move into a new home that was built before 1978, when we banned lead paint, uh, you're required to get a warning. Be very careful around old windows, old doors, and if you see chipping, peeling paint, do something about it because um, lead paint is a big problem in millions of homes. There's a good argument, and we're putting it forward in this uh, report, that landlords should similarly warn tenants that you should be using ventilation and a whole bunch of other measures that Andy laid out to really minimize exposure anytime you turn on the gas stove. Um, and the other option, of course, for landlords is to help tenants uh, by either replacing uh, the gas appliances, offering induction cooktops, um, but most importantly, and most importantly, uh, making sure that if the gas stove is going to be there for a while, that is indeed vented, uh, and we get that pollution outdoors, um, not concentrating um, in the place where we are now spending upwards of 90% of our time. So those are a few of the recommendations. Um, it's a patchwork of existing policies across the state and at the national level. Uh, and we're very hopeful that with the release of this report from a, uh, an amazing coalition, that in fact, we spur a very important conversation that we need state, federal, local leadership to really fill in these gaps and making sure people are not being exposed to dangerous levels of pollution that you literally don't find outdoors anywhere in the United States today. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bruce, and thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, we'll turn now to some of your questions. I'll be reading them out of the, uh, out of the question box. Uh, the first question comes from Howard Kessler, and he says, one of the presenters suggested that induction stovetops are a safer choice. I'm concerned that the ICNIRP has stated that this technology, the induction stovetops, uh, emit higher levels of non-iodizing radiation than considered acceptable for risk. Uh, do we have anybody on, on among our presenters who knows about non-ionizing radiation from induction cooktops? I, I recognize it's not the, uh, the central topic of our presentation today. No, but this is Mark. Uh, since I made that comment, uh, I'll just uh, clarify, uh, specifically referring to um, the heating uh, side of uh, safety, um, uh, as you can see in the picture in my presentation. Uh, my preschool children uh, like to help, uh, and I put that in parentheses and air quotes, uh, my uh, our cooking. Uh, and one of the really wonderful things about uh, induction cooking and the reason that uh, my wife insisted we uh, change more quickly um, is uh, that the cooktop itself does not actually heat up. Um, so there's a much lower risk. Uh, there's some residual heat from the pan, but only the pan itself heats up and the food heats up, not the cooktop itself. So A, it cools down much faster, um, and there's a much lower risk of uh, incidents uh, in regards to burns uh, and other um, safety concerns, as well as just not having gas, uh, carbon dioxide, all the other health risks. There's it's just simply a much lower um, safety risk. Thanks for that, Mark. Uh, our next question is, are your conclusions about hazardous gas release and exposure from <clears throat> data from Western countries, that is to say North America or Europe, or worldwide? So perhaps um, uh, one of our two co-authors, Brady or Andy, could jump in on that and reflect on the sources of the data that you um, were basing the report on. Sure, this is Brady. I can jump in and Andy, feel free to add. So for this report, we chose to focus on just North American studies. So this is um, US and Canadian studies. However, in the process, I have amassed a large library of studies from the UK, from Europe, from Australia. And in, in fact, one very interesting one from Australia, which we chose not to include, that was able to find 12.3% of the childhood asthma burden in Australia is attributable to the gas stove. We don't yet have that number for the US, but we know that it's, it's not zero. And so I think in the future, it would be very interesting to do more of a worldwide study. There's quite a bit also from Asia and uh, a lot more. So if that is something interesting, I would be happy to send through links to some of these publications. Great, thank you. Um, we can see if we can uh, perhaps get those um, get those available and send them out to the people who have registered for uh, today's event. Here's another question. Um, it says there are biomarkers one can measure from EMR exposure 
at the levels at which we are being exposed. Apparently, there are thousands of publications, uh, uh, according to um, researchers. Uh, there's not really a question posed here. I wonder if anybody has any um, comment on on uh, biomarkers for EMR exposure. Well, let's, let's move on. I'm sorry, do we have an answer there? Uh, no, I just said, uh, this is Mark again. I'll just highlight one other safety issue with gas. I mean, um, as folks in the Merrimack Valley in Massachusetts know very well, um, gas explodes. There's a gas leak or an explosion that's, uh, sorry, explosion or a gas leak that sends somebody to the hospital every four days in this country. Um, so just, uh, again, the safety issues with gas extend well beyond just the health uh, issues that we're talking about. Here. Okay. Um, here, here's another question. Um, you cite numerous research studies. Why has this research gone unrecognized if it has existed for so many years? Uh, this is Bruce. Let me take a stab at that because I that, that is an issue we have been really trying to understand as well. And I, I think the uh, the anecdotes we have thus far, it's not dispositive, but the anecdotes thus far is that um, there has been, as Brady laid out uh, and Andy, this 40 plus years of studies. And if you go and look at the websites of the likes of US Environmental Protection Agency, Housing and Urban Development, Consumer Product Safety Commission, California Air Resources Board, they all talk about the burning of fossil fuels inside a tight building is a really bad idea. And uh, so we've been talking to a bunch of indoor air quality experts, including the long list of um, reviewers you saw on the first page. Uh, and it was interesting, a couple of them, three of them independently all said, the way we have been making policy on indoor air quality is through consensus-based standards set by standard setting bodies like ASHRAE uh, and other um, building uh, experts. And they all said to a T, that uh, in all of these proceedings, the gas industry has been um, very active uh, at pushing back on any efforts to try to do anything about gas stove pollution, including, because these are consensus-based processes, withholding their uh, vote, if you will, on moving this forward through the traditional standard setting body. So uh, that was alarming uh, to hear that from researchers in Colorado, on the East Coast, one here in California, that they have all been trying to take this research and do something uh, through the sort of orderly process of how building policy is getting made. And I think really underscores why this report is so important because that process is not working. Hap this stuff happening behind closed doors and the conversations that are happening have clearly left a lot of people exposed to dangerous levels of air pollution. And our hope is with this report, we shine a bright spotlight and get sunshine on this issue so that we can have a more uh, fact-based policy conversation around, wow, the science is really raising a lot of alarm bells here. And it is time to fill in the gaps, policy gaps that um, mean that we have literally tens of millions of Americans who are breathing levels that would be unsafe. So um, we need to get it out of the behind closed doors and have an open public conversation around um, this problem that is, has really been in plain sight, but we have not um, really helped amplify. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Uh, here's a question for Dr. Ringenberg. Uh, you talked a, a lot about the dangers for children. Um, can you talk more about the risks to adults? Um, yeah, obviously as a pediatrician, I, I focus more on babies and children, but uh, I like adults too. Um, and, yeah, the, the biggest thing is um, adults with pre-existing, I mean, the, the biggest risks I think are with adults with pre-existing uh, medical conditions like uh, COPD, like asthma, uh, heart disease, um, uh, sickle cell anemia is the big issue, especially in the African American community, because of the issues with with carbon monoxide. It can cause um, issues for those folks. Um, so I, I, I think that the dangers are probably um, there with 
with adults, but, but not to the level as they are, certainly with healthy adults. I mean, a healthy adult being exposed to a carbon monoxide at high levels, yes, they're, they're gonna get us, they're gonna get sick uh, and potentially, you know, they could die. Um, but I think that the biggest issue again is probably with our, our children, our infants, uh, perhaps pregnant women. I don't think there have been many studies, at least for indoor pollution and pregnancy. Uh, there have been some for um, outdoor pollution, and um, and I think um, so. So yes, there are risks to adults too, even even healthy adults. Okay, thank you. Madam Andy, you you may want to contribute to that. I don't know. Um, you looked at a lot more of the literature than I did. Yeah, the the best studies show that children uh, are the highest risk group. Um, they're more likely to have respiratory illnesses and uh, more likely to actually uh, have uh, more severe asthma symptoms if they do have asthma, and they're more likely to actually be at risk for getting asthma. So children are at the highest risk of all the groups, but there are uh, po you know, adult populations who uh, may have underlying health conditions like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which um, it, someone with that type of disease would be much more sensitive to nitrogen dioxide um, and the effects of it. Thanks, Andy. Uh, here's a different kind of a question. Somebody said he's uh, looking at buying a, a uh, High-end induction cooktop. He says my four-burner Bosch cooktop would cost two thousand and forty-nine dollars. Now that's definitely a high-end one. He said I reached out to a friend in Switzerland who has a Siemens, the same as the Bosch induction with five burners. I asked her what it cost, and she said twelve hundred dollars. Why the price gouging in the United States? Barb, uh, this is Bruce. We have been looking at that very issue, and um, our, we looked at what is the lowest cost induction range in Europe, where they're very common, and it turns out they're literally half price, very similar to the story you just uh, recounted, uh, and it's simply because they're more mainstream. Here, because induction is such a superior product, it is seen as a high-end option, and many retailers only sell high-end induction stoves. So it just takes a little more digging and work to find the more, um, the more affordable ones. And our hope is that as we begin to have a more vibrant conversation around the need to reduce gas stove pollution, that the manufacturers will respond to that need and offer the same product they're selling uh, across Europe uh, and help make all this uh, uh, as affordable as possible. Well, that would certainly be very welcome, and I hope that our, our report uh, helps to move us in that direction. Somebody else asks, as a constituent, what's the best way to make my voice heard to both federal and local policymakers to encourage them to adopt your policy recommendations? This is Mark. It's a great question, and a lot of it's going to depend on where you are, um, what the particular opportunities are in your local community. Um, at the federal level, certainly, um, looking ahead to uh, future opportunities um, for uh, the federal government to support uh, states who are uh, leading and providing incentives and rebates uh, for these products, um, as well as support states in um, more advanced building codes. There's going to be uh, potentially, uh, there's always the opportunity for the federal government to really support states uh, in uh, moving forward. And then uh, Bruce can certainly uh, might want to speak to um, you know some of the potential for uh, limiting air pollution if you'd like to. Um, but the best way to make your voice heard is to, uh, as we highlighted, work with your local uh, partners, um, reach out to uh, groups like labor, affordable housing, et cetera, um, and to um, organize, to communicate with your decision makers at a local and federal level, uh, to get your friends to communicate to, to do it, to, um, uh, you know, if you do have an induction stove or know somebody who does, uh, hold a house party uh, once we're able to uh, actually meet up again um, or a virtual one. We're thinking about uh, virtual cooking demonstrations here too. So a lot of great opportunities to engage, but ultimately, um, especially in this time uh, where we're stuck at home, um, communicate uh, with your decision makers um, and uh, happy to provide some action alerts as a follow-up as well. Great, thank just, you. Let me just add, we have three amazing grassroots organizations on this call. 
positions uh, for social responsibilities, Mothers Out Front, Sierra Club, they all have local groups and chapters who are doing amazing work. Um, it's an awesome opportunity to get involved locally, um, and I couldn't uh, recommend those three organizations enough. Thank you, Bruce. Here's a different question. Is there any hazardous emission data on biogas uh, versus fossil fuel-based gas? That's a great question. This is Mark again. Actually, we're going to be having uh, releasing a report in the coming weeks um, on uh, biogas specifically. Um, it's important to note, though, that biogas is just methane. Uh, it is the same product, ultimately, moving through uh, the pipes as gas. Um, and so uh, it comes from a different source. It's not, uh, you know, uh, drilled from out of the ground. It's created differently, but it's still ultimately the same fundamental product. Um, so burning it inside a home has essentially the same um, uh, impacts. Uh, le it leaking out of the system has the same climate impacts. Uh, it's a different source, but ultimately it's essentially the same product. Okay. Um, our next question is, most professional kitchens are required to have CO or carbon monoxide monitors near the stove. With levels of gas not being vented outside and not trig triggering the monitor, still be at levels that are of risk to a chef? This is Brady. Um, potentially, one of the things I was so surprised at during, during this research was the levels that most smoke alarms and uh, carbon monoxide detectors are set at are much below uh, where certain individuals, especially those with underlying conditions, can feel the effects. So if you've had a chance to look at the report, there's one chart in particular where we highlight uh, the, the UL rated carbon monoxide detectors, which most of the ones in the states must meet, and then what health effects can be for certain populations. It's very stark. So you can get lower level alarms that will alert you if, the, if it reaches um, a significant level, but it's something that's not standard. And so I would encourage you to look at that chart and for chefs and for those that who are working in the restaurant industry, I do think it's something to be thinking about that we may not hear the beeping of an alarm at the level in which we feel the effect. Thank you. Uh, next question is, my region is off the gas grid and many cook on gas stoves converted to run on propane. Are the risks the same or similar for propane stoves as they are for gas? This is Andy. Uh, We've actually received this question before. It's interesting, when we've looked through uh, the studies that were done, the studies are done on with gas stoves, but uh, propane and gas uh, are made of similar uh, carbon products. And so when you burn them, they have similar byproducts of nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide. Uh, we don't know, I, I personally wasn't able to find how burning, uh, propane differs in the amount of nitrogen dioxide versus a gas stove. So it's it's hard for me to answer exactly, but you would still find nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide as a byproduct. I would echo Andy's and also let you know that uh, the World Health Organization in 2010 put out a major report and a large section was on nitrogen dioxide. It's called Selected Pollutants and in there they do pull out a few different studies from Hong Kong and other areas that look at propane and look at this issue. We didn't study it in this report, but that would be a place to go. And also to just make a note that around the world, there's a push towards cleaner fuels. as It's a continuum of going from the health damaging particulate matter and PM 2.5 that's mostly found in wood towards the cleaner um, fuels. And there's a major initiative underway called the HAPEN trial that's actually looking at LPG and with propane uh, compared to others. So we should have some data out of there. One thing I wanna highlight is that NO2 is a completely understudied pollutant. Uh, even in the 2016 integrated science assessment from the two prior 2008, every single organ in the body and the health effects was essentially strengthened. And in 2016 from EPA, that's where we find a causal relationship from 
small doses of nitrogen dioxide to the, the respiratory health effects. And for cardiovascular and others, it's suggested or very likely or likely. So just to highlight that, I think some of this research on nitrogen dioxide is new, and this is a pollutant that we're starting to pay more attention to. So just to highlight that the HAPEN study may be a very interesting place to look in the next couple of months. Thank you. Uh, we have a request from one of our listeners uh, and a very useful reminder to talk about the companion report. I believe this is the one that was just published by UCLA called Residential um, Gas Appliances. Oh, wait, I bet I missed part of the title. Well, Residential Gas Appliances on Indoor and Outdoor Air Quality and Public Health in California. And I think we may have a couple of people on this call who actually contributed to that companion report. Would you like to tell us a few words about it? I could go, this is Brady again. Anyone else feel free to jump in, but I'll give you my um, top levels of why I think this is a fantastic report and a great contribution to this to the space. So in this report, UCLA looked at what are the effects of all of our gas appliances, the stove, the water heater, the furnace on the indoor air and the outdoor air. And to me, the top level from the indoor was they found in 90% of the cases when you cook inside, whether that's an apartment, a single family home, or a town home, 90% of the time, uh, the nitrogen dioxide levels were higher than outdoor standards, which are also outdated, but that's, that's another story. And the most impactful was the small apartments. So the smaller, older apartments, 98% of the times the, that number was exceeded. So it really gets into this equity issue and the need to focus on lower income households. On the outdoor piece, they were able to measure through emission factors, and this is also caveated by saying this is assuming all emissions are vented to the outdoors, because we don't have a good way yet to capture at a state level what that will look like indoors. So if all these emissions were vented outdoors, that would lead to 350 premature deaths every year, and the monetized health costs of burning gas in buildings is 3.5 billion dollars a year. So I think this is a really interesting piece. It's pulling just gas from just the residential sector, starting to monetize those costs outdoors um, and really highlight, highlighting the work that is still to be done to quantify that indoors. So it's a great contribution and very timely. Thank you. Um, speaking of the other sources of, uh, of uh, gas burning in our homes, here's a question that says, what should we think about gas heating and gas fireplaces. Now, I know one of you did mention that gas furnaces are required to be vented to the outdoors, and that certainly is an important uh, factor, uh, but what about gas fireplaces? Unvented gas fireplaces are certainly an issue. There's been a couple great studies actually coming out of from Shelly Miller and her group in Colorado that looks at and measures the impact of unvented gas appliances. One of the things we know is that these are often used and, and on for longer times than the stoves, which can get into this whole thing of time, minutes times exposure equals risk, right? And so I think that there's certainly a lot of, a lot of data out there on that piece. I would also say, and this goes back to a different question, that there is some information on heating gas heating and in particular from the UK and in Europe and how that affects children in schools and actually finding that brain development and other issues can be impacted from burning gas and some of those emissions from commercial heaters in, in buildings. So I think this is highlighting that there's some more future reports down the line to look at some of these other appliances indoors and also um, some of the other schools and commercial buildings. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, and here's a question that reminds us about some of the other um, potential threats to health that are associated with um, methane gas or, or fracked gas. It says, as you know, shale gas formations like the Marcellus Shale are highly radioactive. Is there research showing that the gas coming out of my stovetop could be radioactive? We have any takers on that? Uh, there was a group uh, that gave a, a presentation at uh, at a conference in Boston a couple of years ago that they were uh, trying to characterize 
of what is coming out of gas stoves. And I know that they have not published that work yet. So I, what I would say is it's coming. Okay. Well, that's good to know. We've, um, we've exhausted our time. I'm very sorry for those of you who submitted questions that we weren't able to answer. But uh, thank you all so much. Thank you, our presenters, for being on the phone with us. Uh, Brady Seals, Dr. Ringenberg, Andy Krasner, Mark Kresowick, and Bruce Nellis. And of course, for all of you who are um, here as our audience, thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe and stay well. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we are so excited uh, to have you. And with that, I want to pass it over to uh, my colleague, Cora. Take it away. Hi, um, I just want to echo Logan's thanks. We're really excited about this event. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Cora Weisbord. I'm one of the facilitators of the Massachusetts Building Electrification Accelerator uh, and also a volunteer with Mothers Out Front. So we have um, amazing speakers today and a lot to learn in an hour. First, we're going to hear from Sarah Ross, a co-founder of Undaunted K-12 on making the case for all electric schools and leveraging new federal and local incentives supporting school electrification. Uh, next, Pip Lewis, a principal with HMFH Architects, will discuss designing Boston's new Josiah Quincy Upper School. Uh, Talia Fox, the sustainability manager with the town of Arlington, will tell us about Arlington's air quality and electrification master plan. Um, and finally, we'll share some resources and actions before moving into our Q&A. Uh, next slide, please. So to get us started, uh, we're gonna hear from Sarah Ross. Sarah is a co-founder of Undaunted K-12. Undaunted K-12 is a nonprofit focused on supporting America's public schools to make an equitable transition to zero carbon while preparing youth to build sustainable futures in a rapidly changing climate. Sarah is an experienced clean energy executive. Prior to Undaunted, Sarah founded SunGage Financial, a residential solar finance company that makes rooftop solar available to more homeowners. Sarah lives in an all-electric net zero retrofit in Amherst and loves that her teenager is learning to drive an electric vehicle. Um, Sarah, thank you for joining us and for kicking us off today. I will let you take it from here. There we go. Thanks for unmuting me. So nice to be with you all today. Look, you can move on to the next slide. As Cora mentioned, uh, we are part of a nonprofit undaunted K-12 that's focused on helping states really connect the dots between their climate aspirations, their climate ambition, and the role that they play in school infrastructure. This is a very exciting moment for school infrastructure. So we're excited to talk to you all about uh, how we can leverage that new funding in our schools in Massachusetts. Logan, you can move on to the next slide and then keep going from there. So, if we want to electrify our schools, I'm going to make the case that we need to focus on HVAC systems. Why is that? Why do we need to focus on HVAC systems? So it turns out HVAC systems are actually the largest user of energy in our school buildings. Over on the left, you're seeing uh, heating, cooling, and ventilation, the three components that really make up an HVAC system taking up well over half of the energy that a school uses. So they, they are kind of the, the big, uh, big user of energy. Then on the right, you see, you know, of that heating energy usage, the vast majority of our heating systems in Massachusetts rely on fossil fuels, uh, gas, oil, a little bit of dual fuel in there. In fact, this is as of the last inventory in 2016, you know, we, we should have uh, a newer one, but this is the best we have right now. Almost 98% of our HVAC systems in the state in schools burn fossil fuels. So big energy users, highly reliant on fossil fuels. You can go to the next slide. So uh, next I'm gonna make the, the statement, the contention that switching to heat pumps is the single most impactful action we can actually take in our school buildings to contend with climate change. Why, why is that the case? So let's step back and just make sure everyone knows what a heat pump is. Uh, heat pumps are a magical piece of mechanical systems that actually do a smart thing and move heat rather than burning fossil fuels to make heat. This eliminates all the on-site combustion that would normally be associated with an HVAC system. This improves indoor and outdoor air quality. 
Uh, heat pumps are also highly efficient, whereas a brand new top of the line gas boiler is only going to get to 98% efficient. Uh, heat pumps can get, particularly ground source heat pumps, can get to from 300 to 600% efficient. That means for every one unit of energy we're putting in to run this piece of mechanical systems, we're getting three to six units of heat out of that. And again, that magic happens because we're moving heat rather than burning things to make heat. The last thing to know about a heat pump is right, it, that it offers both heating and cooling. This is really important for our, our school buildings. We can move on to the next slide. So part of the reason why we need to focus on HVAC systems is because they're not up to the job right now in our schools. You know, we've certainly experienced uh, through COVID the challenges of, of out-of-date HVAC systems. But as we look forward, what schools are contending with more and more is extreme heat and the fact that our schools in the Northeast were not built to, to contend with these extreme temperatures. There's an estimate that nationally, we're gonna to have to spend $40 billion just to keep up with the demand for cooling in our schools. And teachers, rightly, are now actually starting to bargain on things like the temperature in their classrooms. You're seeing a post here from the Boston Teachers Union showing it you know, 88 degrees in the classroom. This has real impacts on students' ability to learn and their health. Next slide. The other reason that heat pumps are, are, are really an important piece uh, is that they can help us substantially reduce our contribution to building emissions. So on the left, you're seeing a chart that was in the decarbonization roadmap showing the square footage of schools. Unfortunately, and Logan, you can go to the next slide, they made a little boo-boo in the square footage there. Schools are actually a top five building type when we look at all our square footage of commercial buildings that we need to decarbonize by 2050. And they're top of the line in terms of our public building types. So they are a really important sector in which to do this work. Next slide. So now is really the moment to take action. Why is that? You've already gotten kind of the spoiler alert there, right? These new federal funds that are now available for schools. So on the left-hand side, Inflation Reduction Act provides uh, a new basically 30 to 50% off coupon, you can think of it as, for in particular, the most uh, efficient of the heat pumps, the ground source heat pump. This funding, like many parts of the investment tax credit in the Inflation Reduction Act is available for 10 years. So schools have a really long runway to think about how to do their long-term facilities planning to be able to move in this direction. It's non-competitive. Uh, there's no application in the sense that it needs to get, you know, you need to kind of justify your expense. This is about documenting the work that you've done. And it's paid for the first time as a cash payment to non-taxable entities like schools. There is no funding cap on this, uh, on this opportunity. So it's, they're not gonna kind of run out of money. The typical value for this incentive will be somewhere between two to $6 million, just to give you some sense of how much this is really going to be worth school to schools as they seek to move in this direction. Now, schools in Massachusetts can pair that with a newly enriched, really valuable incentive from MassSave. They now are offering $4,500 per ton of, this is like based on the size basically of the HVAC system, for schools, both in new construction and importantly in retrofits. Similarly, this is non-competitive. So the typical value of this incentive will be between 500K and 2 million for a school. Next slide. So to wrap this all together in a project that I know well, it's going on here in Massachusetts right now, we have some price points for a new school where we're hoping to combine a ground source heat pump a uh, solar array that'll provide the clean energy for this heat pump. And right now the price points for those two really important, really valuable pieces of technology is $13.7 million. Just to give you a sense of, again, how these incentives will reduce that upfront cost, that mass save incentive is gonna take $1.6 million off the sticker price. The Inflation Reduction Act is gonna take somewhere between 30 and 50% off the sticker price turning the new cost upfront to this district of somewhere between 5.2 million and 8 million. That is a, just a whirlwind change from you know, where things were before the Inflation Reduction Act was passed, 
before MassSave made these incentives even more valuable. So in talking with engineers across the country, uh, post Inflation Reduction Act, what I'm hearing is that as they are bidding out new work, they're finding that ground source heat pumps, the thing that used to be the most expensive, uh, is now coming in as the least cost option for many of their clients. So this is just a huge, a huge change and something that Massachusetts schools can all organize to take advantage of you know, in the coming years. Next slide. Really, there are six, just to highlight, there are six benefits for, and we've touched on some of them of why this is so valuable moving from a pre-IRA world where the vast majority of our schools are dependent on gas and oil, adapting these new cooling needs, enhancing efficiency, improving air quality. There's also health and safety concerns in getting this combustible fuel out of our schools uh, when paired with solar and energy storage, as they're going to do in Acton Boxborough, we can build the resilience of our school buildings. And of course, you know, by removing the combustion of these fossil fuels, we are helping schools participate and be part of mitigating impacts on climate change and achieving our Massachusetts goals of achieving net zero. Next slide. Thank you so much. Uh, you'll hear from me again later on in, in the presentation. Uh, and uh... thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, um, are you introducing me or? Yes, uh, I, I am trying to get the tech. All right, all right, we can all see each other again. Um, Sarah, <laughs> thank you so much for your presentation, um, for sharing these game-changing new incentives, particularly, uh, and for setting the stage for us. Um, so next we will hear from Pip Lewis with a Boston School case study. Um, Pip is a principal at HMFH Architects and AIA and LEED AP certified. Uh, HMFH Architects is a Cambridge-based woman-owned architecture firm specializing in the design of innovative, sustainable learning environments. Pip has over 40 years of experience in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry and has led the design of numerous successful school projects across Massachusetts. Most recently, he has been the project director for the new all-electric carbon neutral Josiah Quincy Upper School in Boston's Chinatown neighborhood. Uh, Pip, thank you so much for being here. I will let you take it from here and tell us all about the Quincy Upper School. Okay, thank you. Um, next slide. And you can go on to the next slide. Um, and uh, so thank you for having me here to, to talk about this. The uh, Josiah Quincy Upper School um, uh, which I hopefully will offer some um, lessons um, in electrifying schools while providing a high quality uh, indoor uh, environment um, for the students. Um, the Josiah Quincy Upper School is unusual because it's very urban. It's being constructed in Boston's extremely dense Chinatown area. And next. Um, it's a full service middle high school school for 650 students, but it's being built on less than an acre of land. So it's a very rare, very vertical school and has none of the usual outdoor play space that you might usually expect to, to find in a school. Next. Uh, a Tufts University study uh, recently found that the area uh, that's being built in has the most polluted air in Massachusetts due to being located directly adjacent to the Mass Pike and so close to the massive I-93 uh, interchange and also railroad tracks. Next. Um, you can, uh, it also was being designed when the then mayor uh, Walsh issued a, a zero carbon executive order uh, asking that new municipal buildings be built uh, uh, with to be electrically heated and cooled. So that became our, our goal uh, for, for the project. And as you see here, um, we also created a very large uh, outdoor educational space on the roof area of the Quincy Upper School, uh, where students will find activities such as outdoor classrooms, student gardens and gathering spaces, uh, giving students an opportunity uh, to get some fresh air 
way up high where the tough study says the air will actually be cleaner than it is at, at grade. Uh, next. Uh, the study also recommended that buildings might mitigate poor air, air quality by following a few steps, and we have uh, incorporated them into the design of the, the building. First of all, all of the airs, all of the school's fresh air is drawn from up as high as possible and facing away from the pollutant source, which in this case is the turnpike. Uh, the, uh, the classroom air, for instance, will come from rooftop units located 130 feet above the street. We also upgraded uh, the um, MERV 13 and 14, uh, MERV 13 filters to MERV 14 filters in order to decrease the amount of, of particulates that, that's in the air that people will breathe inside the school. Um, and then one final step that we took was uh, to use the uh, displacement ventilation system within the rooms of the school, but I'll get to explaining that um, in, a, in a moment. Next, you can go to the next slide. First, I wanted to look at how we, um, uh, some of the process of choosing the, the system um, using a um, life cycle cost analysis and other methods. Um, and this was actually a, a, a complex process, which is full of choices. And we found also full of some compromises, which you'll hear about. Uh, the first cluster of uh, information there uh, goes to predicting the uh, energy that a building will consume, resulting in a simulation for that building or an energy model. The second cluster um, uh, is uh, establishing what the costs of that system will, will be, including first the, the, the first construction costs, maintenance costs over time, and uh, the useful equipment life uh, uh, replacement costs, all resulting in a life cycle analysis, life cycle cost analysis. Go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, and we looked at several options that all really focus on all electric choices. And the life cycle cost analysis really led us to looking at um, uh, the, the top two options there, one and two, which are actually uh, both very similar uh, displacement ventilation options and are kind of illustrated, if you can see in the, in the upper, that little um, model of a room there on the upper portion of the, of the slide. Um, the only difference between the two systems is, I'll get to later on, it involves um, boilers. Um, but they both use water source heat pumps uh, located on the roof uh, to condition the air very effectively and radiant panels within the rooms uh, to temper the spaces. You can go to the next slide. Um, and we also took a great effort to uh, develop a very tight building, very efficient building with a low EUI. EUI is simply a measure uh, that can be used to, to estimate the amount of energy per square foot per year that a building will use. We came at um, Quincy Upper, we're at 24. You could, that compares favorably with the other schools that we show in green there that we have done. And it's interesting to see that the average, um, the national average for K-12 schools is 75, which is three times as much energy being expended per square foot than we're expecting the new Quincy Upper School to use uh, next. And now um, uh, to sort of explain uh, displacement ventilation and contrast it with the traditional mixed air method that we're all used to seeing. In mixed air systems, uh, warm or chilled air, depending on the, um, on the season, is projected into the room at a relatively high speed uh, to mix with other air uh, to reach the desired temperature. Um, in displacement, um, however, large quantities of air um, are allowed to flow out low across the room at a slow speed, displacing the, um, uh, the, the existing warm air there. The occupants themselves in the room heat the air slowly and it will rise vertically to the ceiling where it's exhausted. This vertical motion limits the spread of dust and allergens around the room. And in addition to providing a very good uh, and very quiet indoor air uh, in, uh, quality in, environment. But next slide. 
we did run into some stumbling blocks or a stumbling block. The water source heat pumps that we were trying to use uh, could not extract enough heat on the coldest winter days to sufficiently heat uh, the, uh, the school. And so we needed to supplement with um, uh, supplemental boilers, uh, which are located on the top of the building, that long gray box on the right-hand side. Um, and these either needed to be powered by electricity or gas-fired. Uh, uh, next. So our life cycle cost analysis showed us, unfortunately, that the, that the power for these electric boilers which is system one in the chart there, would cost significantly more over a 20-year period than the gas fire boards, which is system 1A. And across the bottom of the page there, you see the savings, those numbers are the savings that are predicted over a 20-year period uh, compared to a baseline. And that really doesn't show uh, good results for an all uh, electric uh, system. Um, but go to the next slide. Please, uh, thank you. There are ways of mitigating this uh, uh, cost difference. We at uh, Quincy Upper plan to use a photovoltaic array to offset the uh, costs of the um, of the electricity. We ran into some hurdles there, but we'll we'll talk about it in just a bit. But one might also use uh, air source heat pumps on the roof that would eliminate. We, we understand entirely the need for the supplemental boilers. However, these are very large and uh, would take up more space than we wanted to use, to, which we wanted to prioritize for that rooftop educational space that you saw. You could also use a geothermal system or ground source heat, heat, uh, heat pump system uh, that Sarah talked about. Um, and uh, that would also eliminate the need for these supplemental uh, bo boilers. But in Quincy Upper's case, we had such a tight urban site that we really didn't have any open land to use for uh, the drilling of the well fields. Next. And as, as I said, we our intention at Quincy Upper was to use a photovoltaic system, but even this system needed to be very small because our rooftop is very small and it had to stay off of the area that was gonna be occupied by students. And so it had to be built on uh, structure over the mechanical um, units that are on the roof. So it was also expensive to, to provide that structure. And as we did an analysis of the, the energy that the system would generate versus the cost of the system over time, we were finding a savings, but the savings wasn't enough to uh, completely mitigate the, um, the high cost of electrical for the boilers. Um, and so eventually, as we wrestled with the, with the budget, um, we, um, had to value engineer out that system. Now, I really don't think that most school projects will have the same uh, problems finding uh, the, the perfect system as the Quincy Upper School did, because you'll have plenty of rooftop area, plenty of site area, and you'll, you'll find one or more practical and very economical ways of providing an all uh, electric facility. Happily, Quincy Upper chose to adhere to the city's commitment to a zero carbon all electric facility and stayed with the electric boilers despite our electric utility costs. Next. And so the construction of Boston's new all electric school is already towering over the mass pike as, as we speak and open for classes in 2024, which uh, as you, you can see this future occupant certainly appears to find the concept of this electrifying. Thank you. Um, Pip, thank you for sharing that gorgeous school with us. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Talia Fox on Arlington's air quality and electrification master plan. Talia is the sustainability manager for the town of Arlington. In this role, she is leading implementation of the town's net zero action plan, green communities program, Arlington community electricity program, and the Electrify Arlington campaign, among other projects targeting greenhouse gas reduction. Talia has expertise in community-driven sustainability and resilience planning, facilitation, and equitable community engagement, and has led several climate action planning processes in the greater Boston region. Talia holds a master's in city planning from MIT. Talia, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. 
Thank you, Cora. All right, so I'm Talia, I'm the Sustainability Manager for the Town of Arlington, and I'm excited to be sharing a little bit about, at a high level, our uh, air quality and electrification master plan for the town. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. And the next slide. I'll just mention that I was not here for the beginning part of this process as I only came on board um, earlier in the year. So like uh, many other municipalities, Arlington has a net zero action plan with a goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. We have priority areas in that plan that focus on net zero buildings, zero emissions mobility and clean energy. And one specific priority action we have in there focuses on town buildings, um, specifically reducing energy use from those buildings, maximizing renewable energy technologies, and making new buildings, and specifically major renovations fossil fuel free. You can go to the next slide. So like other municipalities, also municipal buildings are not a huge portion of our total community-wide emissions. Nevertheless, um, it is important that as a municipality, we're focusing on uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from our buildings because we have a degree of control over those buildings, unlike other buildings in town. And um, it's important to be leading by example in this space right now. Next slide, please. So the goal of our master planning effort here was to understand the potential to reduce energy use and fossil fuel use in existing buildings. So um, we're looking here in, sort of in an innovative way, innovative way I think at retrofits um, versus new construction. And we wanted to improve air quality, um, specifically in our schools. And we focused on schools because they represent uh, about three quarters of the total square footage that the town owns and 66%, nearly two thirds of our building energy use in town of the municipal building energy use. Next slide, please. And we decided to focus on six out of our 11 total schools in town here. And that was largely due to the age of the school. Um, the five schools that we did not choose, which are not listed here, are either relatively new or being rebuilt. So Arlington High School um, is actually a new all electric building that is um, underway right now. And so the other schools that we focused on are listed here. Next slide. We had uh, some high level goals for this, uh, for this study. So here are some of the deliverables that are listed in our RFP, which I know um, we'll be sharing after this uh, event. But first we wanted to understand what our baseline was, what existing HVAC equipment and systems did we have in place, electrical service to the building, domestic hot water and the like. And we wanted to identify alternatives. How could we convert our fossil fuel-based heating systems to all electric? We wanted to make sure we could maintain healthy facilities and, and acceptable, if not superior indoor air quality, and then make sure that our classrooms and educational spaces were comfortable for learning and, and teaching. Other uh, deliverables for our RFP included understanding what solar capacity might be needed to offset energy use on site. So we looked at, or our consultant is looking at, uh, rooftop solar photovoltaics and uh, solar hot water, as well as feasibility of battery storage. And then finally, uh, it's important for us to understand the timeline for these projects, for these six schools and their renovations and what they're going to cost. So that's a big uh, part of this, this report. A big focus, as I mentioned, was air quality. It's in the title of the master plan. Um, like in many places, there is an increased concern around air quality following the pandemic. Uh, Arlington invested in a lot of filtration equipment for our schools. Um, and we know here, I think if everybody, anybody who's here knows that electrification supports indoor air quality, we want to be reducing uh, on-site combustion and improving ventilation to support that comfort and, and better learning and working environment. So the two electrification, the two viable electrification options that we looked at, which I'll talk about later, um, have dedicated ventilation air systems to deliver filtered fresh air to all spaces. Here's a high level timeline of our project. Our net zero action plan was adopted just for reference in early 2021. We released an RFP for this project in the summer of 2021 and then con contracted with a consultant CMTA um, in the fall of 2021. And they got started um, late in 2021 into early 2022 with that initial um, baseline assessment of the, the building systems, continuing with an alternatives analysis for the different electrification options. And we are in phase three right now. So I will not be able to share specifics from our budget, um, but uh, that is underway. 
So our consultants looked at four alternatives for our HVAC systems in the six schools. I will say two of these are largely for reference. The, the first one here is an in-kind replacement where we're basically um, assuming that we're going to replace all of the existing equipment with, with uh, new equipment when it, when it breaks. So um, that's keeping natural gas in a lot of cases and, in, and also in other cases, not even including AC because several of our buildings uh, being old buildings do not have AC. The second option here is, uh, I would say, like a standard uh, but inefficient electrific electrification option. So it achieves the goal of electrification, but doesn't do it in the most efficient way possible. It's an interesting comparison point simply because it, um, it does assume a, a certain degree of swap out of existing systems, um, but it's extremely inefficient as we know uh, electric, inefficient as we know electric resistance is, but an interesting comparison point. The two more important uh, options here are the variable refrigerant flow, um, which is an air source heat pump system, and then the ground source heat pump system that we looked at for all six schools. And those are the two more viable electrification options. You can see here on the right, uh, as part of this report, we have proposed geothermal well field designs for all of the schools. So this is one for the Audison Middle School, conveniently has uh, some fields adjacent to the building where we can be drilling. And all of the proposed designs for HVAC uh, use existing ductwork where possible to, to try to reduce costs. Some additional components, some of these things um, uh, have been Pip had mentioned. So we we looked at a few different things in terms of life cycle cost analysis, include it included upfront costs, but also operational costs, maintenance, replacement costs, and solar PV costs. So really take into account what it's going to mean uh, to replace these over the lifetime of the systems. We have some phasing recommendations that um, relate to in what order and uh, how long is it going to take to electrify these buildings. And those are based on the building age, the greenhouse gas footprint of the different buildings and, and the costs. Just considerations for the town to keep in mind as we're thinking about you know, how we're going to sequence this. And then um, all of them have solar uh, designs to to utilize available rooftop space and an additional canopy as needed for net zero energy on site. I think we've talked a lot about these incentives already. So the thing I'll mention here is that the IRA and direct pay option for ground source heat pumps is a real game changer for these projects. For all of the schools, the incentives make it such that the ground source heat pumps cost less than the VRF system. And that's exciting because the ground source heat pump systems are more efficient, operationally speaking. So that's huge. Uh, assuming we can make those ground source systems work, it will sort of depend on the configuration. Um, that, that will be uh, big here. So at a high level, some takeaways uh, here. You know, every system has its pros and cons, and I think the town's going to have to really think about some of these things ranging from aesthetics to operational efficiency. I think every uh, site is going to have its unique configuration and, and considerations there. My biggest takeaway from this whole process has just been the amount of time it's going to take. When we're looking at the time frame that the consultant provided for sequencing just six of our school buildings, we're looking out to 2035, I'd say, on a, you know, with a conservative estimate. I think that's ambitious. And that's just six of our buildings, right? So if we're thinking about a 2050 timeframe for all of this, we, we really need to start planning ahead, not just in Arlington, but I'd say all across the state. Um, and then it was interesting that we did this as a six school plan and um, because of the fact that we know technology is changing, costs are shifting. And so by the time we get to that sixth school, you know, we'll see what, what everything looks like. And, and so we're thinking going forward that maybe it, it makes more sense to do this on a school by school basis so that it, that the planning is a little closer to one we might actually implement. Uh, here are some lessons learned on the procur procurement side from my predecessor who initiated this process. Um, I think it is sort of cutting edge to be looking at retrofitting existing buildings for all electric and finding firms with existing, with experience doing that was a little tricky. So we got fewer proposals than we thought and not all met the minimum qualifications. And then we had some scoping challenges where we basically had to reduce the scope to fit our budget. So just a friendly reminder to state your budgets up front in your RFPs. Finally, we're uh, looking at next steps here in Arlington. So just doing some internal reviews of a draft report um, and then thinking about 
next steps for, for us for these buildings. What's our time frame and what's the feasibility of actually implementing a lot of these recommendations? I'll be keeping an eye on federal and state grants um, and putting in capital requests for similar studies of the rest of the buildings in our portfolio. And that's all for me. Thank you very much. So uh, Talia, thank you so much for sharing your work in Arlington uh, and for leading this critical planning process to retrofit your existing schools. Um, now, Sarah is going to close out today's event by sharing some resources and action steps before we move on to our Q&A. Um, we have a lot of great questions in the chat and we're gonna try and get to as many as we can. Great, thank you. Logan, you can move on to the next slide. So a few resources and some of the questions in the chat uh, will hopefully be answered by this paper, but I won't make you wait for some of them. Uh, so we have a new paper coming out early next year that is really aiming to help school leaders. So not a technical audience, but people like superintendents, school committee members, see the HVAC choices uh, and see how they are connected to the student health and learning that they hold paramount. Um, this is not going to get into technical details. This is really high level strategic thinking about these HVAC choices and does, I will say, make the case for moving to the all electric high performance systems that both Pip and Talia talked about today. We'll put a link in the chat to sign up for that report, but we're, we're very excited about this filling a gap in what we see available to school leaders right now on a topic that can get really confusing and really technical very fast in an unhelpful way. So look forward to that. Uh, the next thing I'll turn you to is or uh, offer to you is the section of our website that we call our K-12 Climate Solution Center. It has a bunch of resources from all around the country, examples of schools, you know, doing various parts of this work, you know, much bigger than HVAC, but this whole constellation of exciting climate action. We have Talia's uh, uh, RFP up there, we've uh, up there posted for folks because that's a great artifact. Um, a plan from Salt Lake City that, that was really led by students, um, other resolutions from you know, schools across the country that are uh, passing resolutions, for example, in Portland to get fossil fuels out of their existing buildings. So a lot of great resources here and those will continue to grow as, uh, as more of that material becomes available. Next. And then you know, lastly, as a point of kind of competitive, uh, get our competitive juices flowing. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that just a few days ago, late October, uh, New York City really put themselves in a leadership position when it comes to retrofitting existing buildings and removing fossil fuels. Uh, the mayor announced a $4 billion plan to electrify uh, 800 schools in New York City. This is their will be the single most impactful thing that the city will do to meet its own compliance with its goals to reduce building emissions. So reminding me, and I should remind all of us that schools are vital to achieving our climate goals. And importantly, they're prioritizing doing this retrofit work in the schools that right now are burning the dirtiest of fuels, the number four heating oil, and in the communities that are most burdened by air pollution. Uh, the, the type of communities that Pip was talking about sitting right next to a highway. So for me, you know, and, and by the way, they connected it to the learning agenda and thinking about how this can help develop a green workforce in New York State. So to me, this is really a model. And I certainly hope that it gets our competitive juices flowing uh, with new leadership here in the state and that we move in this direction of really focusing on retrofits serving the most vulnerable. Next slide. All right, so what can you do today when you leave this event? We have prepared a quick little one pager that will help you engage uh, leaders in your district around this new opportunity to retrofit, make a plan to retrofit and get fossil fuels out of our schools and switch to this new technology. And again, it's really focused on heat pumps given the new incentives from MassSave and uh, in the case of ground source heat pumps, the Inflation Reduction Act. This is available on our website for you to download. We've even given you a little template email that you can uh, make your own uh, as you engage your district leaders. So wanted to offer that up. And I think now question time. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. 
for uh, for those wonderful presentations. So helpful and and so much uh, great content in there. Um, I see that there have been uh, questions coming in from the chat. Uh, so I think what I'll do, I think we'll we'll have time maybe to 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 get to uh, three or four questions. Um, so I've been trying to uh, to pay attention to to the ones that uh, that that might be most suited for 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 everyone. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start with a question that was, uh, that was submitted by, uh, by Martha from, uh, from Melrose, uh, asking about, uh, what section of the IRS, IRS code under IRA offers the heat pump incentive and have, uh, the regulations been promulgated yet, or will they be introduced through a different mechanism? I'm, I'm happy to take that one, uh, Cora. I don't know if you want to drop what I wrote there into the into the chat, but I'll just really oh. say so. It's it's the investment tax credit, which has been around for a while. It's the same vehicle that we've used to grow our solar industry to great heights in this country. What they did with the Inve Inflation Reduction Act was they expanded the technologies that it is available for. Uh, so there's geothermal is, is you know among those new technologies. Um, and they've combined it, importantly, with a new provision called direct pay, which makes this tax credit right now available as a cash payment to non-taxable entities like school. So you really have to see these two things and put them together. And I apologize, I should put the section in there that's the direct pay section, because that's a whole different section. So you got to kind of be expert at reading this stuff and see how these two pieces fit together. But this is an existing playbook that's basically been... Um, been improved on v2.0 i guess you could say and sorry Excellent. and the timing on the promulgation uh so what's available right now is the 30 percent as I, as you noted in my presentation it was 30 to 50 percent so there's an additional 10 percent if you use american-made parts particularly things like steel uh, that um, I think you know, supply chains will still determine whether that is possible and accessible in the short term. I've heard I was talking to some solar installers yesterday, and they said, you know, for for ground mounts, that's going to be really easy to meet the test for domestic content. There for roof mounts, it's going to be a little harder because we don't have American-made panels. We do have American-made racking. So there's an additional 10% that'll come available January one. So this is projects put into service after January one. And then another 10% will be available for uh, projects that are located in what's called an energy community. This is a new concept that was introduced by the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, and we, are, we have yet to see formal US government you know, maps that designate, you, know, you are an energy community, you are an energy community. There are maps out there of folks already opining, kind of guessing and reading the tea leaves, um, but those pieces will become available uh, we expect guidance out from the IRS January, February of 2023. I know there are RFIs out that uh, folks are responding to to help guide the development of those regulations, and, and we should see those early in the new year. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah. And Pip and Talia, is there anything you want to add on to that before we go to the next question? All, all good. Okay, no, so I'll pat... Perfect. So, so this one will actually be uh, might might be a little bit more geared to to your presentation. But someone asked, are there any studies that you can point me to about the health effects of on-site uh, fossil fuel combustion and and to to kind of arm arm folks with you know in the discussion? And I would just add to that, you know, uh, and this is you know Talia and Pip. <clears throat> are there any particular things that you all think about and you keep in mind, you know, with regards to the health impacts uh, as you're looking at planning and developing these these uh, these new all electric buildings? Um, well, I, I can uh, start at, at least the um, I and I'm I'm not really aware of a study on a building by building basis that. Uh, it talks about health effects of combustion on a building. You know, if you're if you are installing gas-fired um, equipment in a building, it's going to be pr uh, pretty efficient and try to get rid of the pollutants up high as much as possible. So I don't know if there's a direct uh, issue that way. But what we were wrestling with at um, for the Quincy Upper School 
And what I think is maybe the bigger impact is the the impact of the environmental air in an in, in an area, and that certainly uh, I, I would have to find um, the references to the study and, and then post them. Um, but the um, um, the work that Tufts University did certainly um, indicates the health effects, uh, asthma, et cetera, um, on the, the uh, people who live in in that uh, in that area and has a can have a big a pretty major effect. Absolutely, Talia. Anything you'd like to add? Sure. Um... So I guess some people here might be familiar with all of the studies that have come out in terms of cooking uh, using gas in homes. I think that that is a good reference point just for the harms of combustion in a space. Um, I would say here in town, we have a gas leaks task force that's working hard on um, repairs to, or I guess advocating for repairs to gas infrastructure. And I think we don't always um, place as much in general and place as much um, import on on those the effects of those leaks, both for the environment and um, for for humans around them. Um, I think in Arlington, we've also been able to demonstrate that those gas leaks are killing trees. Um, so I think there's something to be said, not just for the combustion in the building, but also for the infrastructure that's um, going up to the building. And Absolutely. if Talia uh, suggests something else, you know, uh, because there has been a lot of discussion recently about the effects of cooking with gas. Uh, and uh, so our Quincy School, also we haven't talked about the food service equipment yet, but it's a, an all electric kitchen and all electric um, food tech uh, classroom area. So th those areas have made the, the changeover also in order to, to deal with those, those impacts. That is the same for our study as well. That's excellent. And I know this was going on in the chat, but uh, Sarah, I know you are an abundance of information around studies. So are there any other studies you'd like to, uh, to point folks to? Well, hopefully the jumble that Cora put in there for us will work. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's exactly the information that's gonna be in our forthcoming paper in January. I did just quickly run to that section and, and pull the main pieces of literature that we cite in that report. So you wouldn't have to wait because I'm not about making anybody wait. And, you know, I think I totally agree with Talia that, you know, the all the information coming about gas stoves is really a good indicator. When we did research for this report, there were not a lot of studies, any studies actually that we could point to that really look at the HVAC system specifically. The notion, you know, some people will tell you, well, it's vented. And the idea is you don't have to worry about it. And from my perspective, given that our boilers and our HVAC systems in schools are decades old and desperately need of repair, I have zero confidence that that venting is happening 100% and, and that there's not leakage into our schools. The other piece I threw in the chat was a report that we did earlier um, with HEAT identifying from their gas leaks mapping statewide, the extent to which their gas leaks uh, that they identified um, uh, are co-located with school properties. So these are not leaks inside the building, but these are leaks at the school property, basically in the distribution network. And so, you know, again, present risks to students and those schools. And there, the highlight from that was there were in one year alone, there were 91 school properties where there were gas leaks at the school property in that distribution infrastructure. Wow, that's really helpful, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to kind of I see that there are two comments around around incentives, so I want to kind of bunch them together, and then I and then I want to talk a little bit about the the life cycle analysis that that you all have been working or that you have completed and, and done in, in these instances. But before I do. Uh, some folks asked about uh, when the GSHP incentive uh, will become available. And similarly, uh, uh, someone asked around what, you know, what folks know about how schools and municipalities can benefit from the energy efficiency commercial buildings deduction under section 179D. Um, so I, I assume, I'll pass this over to you, Sarah, first. Um, to see if you have uh, a response to either of those uh, questions. Yeah, so quickly again, the 30% base is available now. The bonus credits, the 210% will be available 
come January 2023. So any projects put into service after January 1, we won't know exactly, we don't have the guidance about exactly how it's going to all come together in terms of the, the process, but any projects put into service after January 1 will get access to those bonus credits. And then yes, the 179D is also available and newly enriched. So up to $5 a square foot now, if you hit a 50% reduction in energy, that needs to be taken. You need to work with a designer on that because they are the ones to actually take the deduction. And then um, you know they, they can theoretically pass and share some of the wealth, but folks like Pip will probably know more about how that's, how that's managed. Um, yeah, that that uh, really uh, states it well, um, because the the school districts are not paying taxes. They can sign over their tax benefits under one seventy nine D to the um, to the designers, and uh, we would share it between um, us and our engineers who are responsible for for the design. Um, and in s some cases, uh, it, it's really not the intent that it's a, it, you know, uh, the, uh, there's a, a payback for it, but there have been communities where we have um, shared s some of the, uh, the tax deduction benefit with the, with the town in terms of a, uh, a, a donation. I, I don't think there's really a way that you're supposed to just give the money directly back but we have provided um, um, uh, uh, some proportion of it as a, uh, a charitable donation to some portion of the uh, of the school um, or the community. Excellent. Yeah, that that that's helpful, uh, Pip. Uh, thanks for for adding on. Um, I have one final question, and um, selfishly, this is one that I have uh, for you, Pip, and you, Talia. Uh, both of you mentioned life cycle analysis and that being kind of a critical piece of the puzzle uh, as you're moving forward. And I'm just curious uh, to what extent you all are incorporating embodied carbon into that discussion, the carbon in the walls, uh, if you are and if you run into any challenges um, along the way as you're doing that. And I can answer quickly that we are not specifically yet with uh, the life cycle analyses that we've done to date, but we're working at it. Um, we're working uh, with our, ourselves and our engineers to get to that point um, where uh, embodied carbon, because that's such an important part of, of the of the equation. So the, the, the life cycle cost analysis that I talked Talked about that we did for Quincy Upper didn't include that at all. But hopefully, as we go forward, we'll begin incorporating uh, that information into our um, in, into our life cycle cost analysis. I have a similar answer, which is that no, it is unfortunately not included in this study. Um, but I hope that we will be able to consider that going forward. It was simply not in the scope. Absolutely. Uh, Sarah, anything you want to add on to that question? Um, okay. Uh, I, th I think, you know, I, I think that, that that makes sense. You know, embodied carbon is, is really becoming um, uh, very much so, you know, coming onto the scene and, and people are recognizing it more and more as the, the elephant in the room um, and something, something that, that absolutely needs to, to uh, be addressed. Um, so we have about two more minutes remaining. So I wanna just conclude with, with two quick things. Uh, the first is I wanna make sure that everyone is aware that we have, you know, we, we, what we're talking about today um, and the opportunities that are being discussed are really changing the game. Uh, but there's no question that we need to continue to move forward. We need to continue to make sure that communities uh, like Arlington uh, like others who are interested, are, are continuing to uh, to get the resources they need to to um, to build out these plans. And so, uh, one proposal um, that that MCAN has has uh, been working on in partnership with uh, Undaunted K through 12 and 145 other organizations is something called a zero carbon renovation fund. Um, and and this is a request uh, to get 300 million. Uh, dollars from the remaining ARPA funds 
um, to be to be set aside specifically for the creation of a fund that would enable um, uh, and and kind of specifically incentivize and fund uh, deep energy retrofits in in places like affordable housing, schools, uh, municipal other municipal buildings, um, and environmental justice communities. So Sarah just put that in the chat, but I'd be remiss if I didn't quickly mention that. Um, the second thing that I, I wanted to just mention, and, and really as a concluding thought, I just wanna thank uh, Pip, you so much, and Talia and Sarah for your incredible expertise and your incredible work um, in, in, you know, uh, with the Quincy School and, and in Arlington. Uh, we're so grateful for all the everything that's happening on the ground and so excited to continue to see it uh, move forward. And I, I also want to thank everyone for joining uh, our call today and for staying till the end. Um, and I hope this was useful. We will, as I mentioned, um, follow up with uh, all of the resources that, that we discussed today. And um, you know, we'll continue working together uh, to ensure that, that our schools, um, the place where our, where our children uh, are spending a whole lot of time are, are healthy, uh, safe climate protectors. So thank you all so, so much for joining. Uh, we're so grateful uh, for all your work and all your leadership on this issue. Well, thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much.